Very happy to be back here again. Um, so just a, just a quick thing before I get started. Uh, you know, Matthias does a great job of preparing us uh, at the speaker event that we have before this whole conference starts. And he said um, last night that you've got to be prepared for the, for the audience in Sweden because S Swedish people have sort of an attitude to um, approaching strangers where it's considered in Sweden, uh, and I'm to, if, probably not getting the quote exactly right, but uh, he said, if you talk to a stranger in Sweden, then you're either drunk or mentally ill. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm gonna force the audience to do a little interaction right at the start here before I get started. Um, and so I'm just gonna take a quick poll, show of hands poll, and this is also, got some Swedish influences in the tradition of the Metro newspaper, which I believe was created in Sweden. Um, and they're always doing these polls, you know. We get, we get the Metro in Boston too, and they do these polls where they ask people about a topic that they have no idea about. So the poll is totally worthless. So in that spirit, um, I want to just do a, a three-way multiple choice poll about where the best hackers in the United States come from. So where you guys think the best, and it doesn't matter if you know anything, um, because Metro style poll. So the options are Boston, home of the loft, San Francisco, home of Google and lots and lots of tech bros, and so East Coast, West Coast, or center of America, so Utah, home of, uh, home of DEF CON's grifter. So <laughs> who says San Francisco? Okay, West Coast, all right. Uh, who says East Coast, Boston? All right, looks better. And who says the middle? Who says Utah? Um, oh, it's, it, I, I see a lot of people are, are definitely doing this Swedish style and not raising their hand for any of this. <laughs> but I'm gonna go. Uh, I'm gonna go with um, with Boston. So that looked like looked like the most most hands to me. So giving it up for the loft, East Coast. Um, all right. So I will get started on this talk. Um, and my talk is Security Vulnerabilities of Autonomous, Unmanned, and Driverless Vehicles. So I thank the previous speaker uh, for leading me into this with the drone hacking talk, which I thought was awesome. Um, and uh, as a little bit of humor that I ripped off from the Stephen Colbert sh show, I think. Um, anyway, a little quick introduction to me and my background in autonomous robots. Um, that's my academic background. That's what my PhD is in. And then I was also on a little show uh, a number of years ago that some people might remember called Prototype This, where we did a few autonomous projects. So this is an autonomous aerial vehicle project for delivering a life preserver to a swimmer in trouble out in the ocean. Um, and so I learned a lot about uh, fixed wing drones and their failure modes uh, and the iterative process there. Uh, and then we also did uh, unmanned ground vehicles uh, for a pressing technological challenge in the United States, which is pizza delivery. So we had a small local two-wheeled vehicle that delivered pizza uh, in the streets of San Francisco. And then we also did a full-size driverless vehicle, um, which did the first ever autonomous crossing of the United States Highway Bridge. So this went out on across the Bay Bridge uh, to Treasure Island to deliver pizza. Uh, and the interesting thing about this is that that this is before the Google, Google Autonomous Vehicle Program, uh, and this vehicle, um, the principal guy behind that was a Google employee uh, that lent us the vehicle, and uh, Google went on to buy his company and do their autonomous vehicle project on the strength of seeing this TV show. So, small claim to fame. Um, and then I also host autonomous vehicle competitions for a group called RoboNation. Um, and one other small Swedish connection here, uh, Malardalen University um, had a team in RoboSub for a couple of years. So um, that's a, that, that these competitions are really cool. But I'm gonna go through that intro stuff quickly um, and just say a few words about the motivation for this talk. Um, obviously, I'm into autonomous vehicles and unmanned systems. Uh, I don't want people to uh, mess around with them. Um, they have a lot of advantages, uh, for example, you don't have the energy cost of being able to, being, having to carry, carry a human driver or pilot. Um, you've got the time efficiency where you don't have to stop for that human to go to the bathroom or eat food or anything like that. Um, and then also we have all these new applications we can do autonomously that we just wouldn't be able to do if we had to put a human on board. So I'm not trying to say, all right, hey, this is, whoa, guys, like we can hack these things, we can mess them up, we're gonna stop the revolution. We're not gonna stop the revolution, but 
like everything that, that humans make, they're going to be hacked. And so we need to understand what their vulnerabilities are. Uh, Europe um, has particular relevance here. So, you know, when you look at the news, a lot of the news is about the American programs like, uh, like Google Waymo and like Uber's efforts and all that kind of stuff. But very, very relevant to Europe. Um, in the UK, Nissan is, is testing autonomous Leafs in London since last year. Um, and Jaguar Land Rover is testing on public roads. Um, and the government has promised to put 200 million pounds. Um, you know, w w after Brexit, that's probably like at least 100,000 kroner. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> into a research fund. All right, Sweden, right? You guys uh, have been doing great. Volvo has been uh, carefully looking at this program. They promised to start trials in 2017, and they just made it. They started in December 2017 in Gothenburg uh, and going all through this year. Um, and here in Stockholm, um, there's been an autonomous bus approved to do some sort of deployment this year. Um, in Germany, BMW is testing 40 vehicles in Munich, um, and they have promised to sell autonomous electric vehicles for the Autobahn in 2021, um, and autonomous bus trials as well uh, in 2018 at a Berlin hospital and another place in Bavaria. And then in France, automated shuttles in Paris started last year uh, testing, and you know a big part of this is legislation uh, and regulation, and so they've passed legislation to allow open road testing, although uh, there, are, there are big restrictions on it still. Um, and then EU has Project Autopilot uh, from 2017 to 2019 um, in six cities, 25 million euro in that fund. So people are serious about it, uh, as well they should be, because here's a, um, a video that I shot of an autonomous helicopter. This is at, at Pax River Naval Air Station in Maryland, uh, undergoing testing. And you just have to look at this and you can say, yeah, like helicopters are really hard to fly. It's kind of a job for a robot. You know, robots are very, very good at doing this kind of thing. Um, so, again, we want, to, uh, we want this to happen, but we also want to talk about vulnerabilities interference to make sure that things are done right. Uh, interesting side note on this, photo, uh, this video that I took. Um, while I was taking the video, I noticed what the sort of test engineers were doing while they took, took off. They were hiding behind the start cart there. <laughs> Just in case, right? So that's, that's, a, that's a security mentality, right? You, you push the envelope, but you also think about what can go wrong. Um, actually, very good idea in this case, because that particular airframe did crash subsequently, um, and it got rebuilt, and it's now in a museum in, in Oregon. Um, but quick definitional stuff on autonomous and unmanned systems. So when we say unmanned, um, it's a wide space. So it just means we don't have a human driver or pilot on board. Um, it doesn't mean that we don't have off-board controllers, supervisors, and so on. They're just not on board. It doesn't mean that you don't have passengers on board, because obviously driverless buses and so on still have passengers. Um, and in general in this space, most of the systems deployed to date have been military. Uh, they're, they're the ones that are really looking, looking at it, uh, because they have a lot of money to spend on those kinds of things, and they have a lot of incentives not to have people on board their systems. Um, so a big part of that uptake has been in the aerial s system space, so the, the drones that you heard about in the last talk. So here's a quick example about uptake here. This is Global Hawk, which is a long endurance surveillance platform. Um, and here is uh, some of the, uh, is a chart of the hours that, that those platforms have been used um, over the years up until I think 2011. It's a little hard to see on that on that graph. But you see basically the beginning of an ex exponential curve in uptake, right? It's like, oh, this stuff works now. It's awesome. We're going to use it as much as possible. Um, and even the government, of course, gets involved. So this is one of my, one of my favorite quotes uh, that we can now use to make fun of Congress in the United States. Um, they passed the Defense Authoriz Act, Authorization Act in 2001, saying that by 2015, they wanted one third of the operational ground combat vehicles in the US military to be un unmanned, right? So unmanned tanks, unmanned uh, delivery vehicles, whatever. Obviously, the government can say whatever it wants, uh, but it's not necessarily going to happen because there are technical challenges. So we, we're now in 2018, not even close, right, to uh, one third of the, un of the uh, ground vehicles being unmanned. So um, the will is there, but the technology has some catching up to do. Uh, here is an example of a military unmanned ground vehicle, um, and as you can see, 
It's the military. They design with threats in mind. It has all kinds of defensive systems on board. Um, but the, the thing I like to point out here, because this is a test vehicle, uh, it's also covered in kill switches. So you just have to get close enough to press the button. It's like, it's like the unshielded reactor exhaust port on the Death Star, you know. <laughs> but I'm not going to talk about military applications anymore in this talk. Uh, instead, um, we're going to keep civil applications in mind because they're the ones that hopefully we're most likely to encounter. Um, and just some examples of application areas in the civil space. We got transportation, obviously. Uh, also oceanography. So the ocean is kind of similar to deep space. It's a really harsh environment, and it's a really expensive environment to put humans out there. It's dangerous. So anything you can do on the ocean is great to do with an unmanned system. Uh, mapping is great, because mapping is super boring. Um, and it has to be done frequently. So if you can make your robo robots do it, that's great. Um, you know, Filmmaking uh, is an area that they started to use aerial drones a lot in initially because they were cheaper than using a real helicopter. Uh, and then obviously that's led into the whole cheap commercial drone space that we have now. Like basically everyone's a filmmaker. If they've got a thousand bucks, they can buy a drone. Um, things you wouldn't necessarily think of, like power line inspection, just like this is like one of those uh, questions they used to ask you if you went to get hired at Google or something like that. It's like, how many miles of power lines do you think there are in like the United States or whatever, and they would you'd have to like do some kind of back of, back of the envelope calculation. But how many miles do you think there are? Right, there's a lot, and someone has to inspect them because they corrode, they get damaged, and so uh, drone aircraft is one way that um, they they do power line inspection. That's also tedious tedious task, um, and then logistics, so transporting stuff like pizza, and many more applications. Uh, some quick like uh, examples that also have a Europe tie-in. So Rolls-Royce says we think that the future of cargo shipping is, is unmanned. Um, one of the reasons is that maritime accidents are mostly caused by people screwing up. Um, so if you have a reliable robot, then you can solve a lot of that problem, just like with cars, uh, car accidents. Um, but cargo shipping has some other interesting challenges. One of the main reasons you want people on board your cargo ship is because things break. and Because voyages are very long, and they're out in the middle of nowhere, and so you want someone on board that can fix stuff when it breaks. So that's something that's an unsolved problem. Um, if you talk to the um, organization that does most of the lobbying for the unmanned systems industry, they say the priority civil uh, applications are precision agriculture, so uh, do, doing all that kind of stuff that you have to do on farms. But you can, if you have a robot doing stuff, you can differentially fertilize individual plants, and you can do all these kinds of stuff like that that's way too tedious for a human to do, and self-driving cars. Uh, and the things that are in the way for self-driving cars, uh, the fact that we have to use shared infrastructure, so we've got to interact with or interoperate with humans that are super unreliable, um, and the fact that people feel weird about the robustness and safety of a system that doesn't have a human driver. Even if they know that humans cause most of the accidents, people still feel weird about it. So you've got to deal with acceptance. So anyway, that's all the intro material um, uh, in terms of just like the background and everything like that. Let's get into the bit that everyone's really interested in in this talk, which is vulnerabilities and failures. So here are a couple of classic examples. Firstly, from the aerial space. Um, this is the RQ-3 Dark Star, which is uh, an all autonomous aircraft uh, that Boeing made uh, for the for the US Air Force. Um, you can, if you want to see one, there's a surviving one uh, hanging up in the Smithsonian in DC, the Air and Space Museum. Um, the original unit procurement cost for this, uh, so the individual, once, once it was ready, if you were going to buy one uh, from, from the manufacturer, it was going to cost $10 million. So, you know, that's a, that's a chunk of change. It's not a lot compared to like a, uh, a jetliner, but um, it's, it's a lot of money. And the prototypes, obviously, they spent a lot more money than that developing them. So what do you think happened the first time they tried to fly the prototype? Uh, and I apologize in advance, because all I have is this successful takeoff video. Um, they would not give me the photo of what, the video of what actually happened in the first, in the first takeoff run. But um, what happened, just you got to imagine here. So instead of it smoothly taking off like that, Imagine that it was coming forward along the runway, started to take off, and it started bobbing up and down crazily, and then flipped over and crashed into the ground and turned into a ball of flame. First, first flight, right? Uh, if you read the actual um, the published after-action report for what happened here the, in the International Journal of Unmanned Systems Engineering, 
It uh, describes a fault in the flight control system leading to porpoising oscillations. Great term. Like, uh, 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 like think, of a, think of a dolphin like jumping out of the water. Um, and it, it crashed. So, well, what happened? What happened was when they were designing the flight control system, they had designed it at one of Boeing's test airfields, which had a poured tarmac runway. So the runway was basically smooth. When they did this first test flight, um, that's where they had all the taxi tests. When they did the first test flight, they did it on a concrete slab runway that had gaps in between these, small gaps in between these concrete slabs. And so those impulses, where the, every time the vehicle rolled over one of these gaps, it got a bump. And the system wasn't prepared for these, like, you know, it just wasn't expecting these sharp impulses that are not like what you'd see flying in the air. And it was overcorrecting for these sharp impulses. And the controller went unstable and it crashed. So the moral of the story here is that the designer's expectations of any system are really critical. Um, and if there's going to be vulnerabilities and exploitation, it's going to happen at these cracks in the boundaries between the conditions that the designers expected. Second example of a classic failure, and this one's a ground vehicle. So this is really getting to the start of the whole um, driverless car space. Uh, the first DARPA Grand Challenge in 2004, the vehicle that everyone expected to win this was Carnegie Mellon University's team called Sandstorm. So they basically did you know, this classic uh, approach where they were like, oh, we want to, the prize for this competition was a million dollars, which is nothing in, if, in your, you know, if you're working on uh, autonomous research robots. And so they were like, oh, we're just going to go all out. We're going to get a huge Humvee. We're going to cover it in sensors. Um, and we're just going to spend whatever it takes to win this competition. Um, so here's some video of that robot uh, starting the course. Um, and you know, it just like, looks badass, right? So like, just covered in equipment. Um, pulls out of the competition, no problem. The 2004 DARPA Grand Challenge ended up being a huge embarrassment because not only did no robot finish, this robot got the furthest out of all of them. It went for um, a few miles only before it, went, it ran off the road, flipped over, and caught fire. Um, here's some video, uh, close-up aerial video of that happening. Um, huge embarrassment, right? DARPA was just like, oh my god, like we gave everyone this big, this big thing, made a huge deal out of it, and then like it was just the worst. So anyway, what happened? Well. Uh, because DARPA really wanted this first competition to be a success, they gave the teams 24 hours before the exact route that they needed to go to drive this vehicle. Oh, I forgot to mention, if, if you don't remember the first Grand Challenge, you had to drive from Los Angeles to Las Vegas uh, autonomously. And so there was a lot of dirt roads and stuff like that because they couldn't do it on public, uh, public highways. So the teams, if they had enough manpower, which CMU did, were able to walk the entire course and take GPS readings all along the way. So you could have completed this course just by following a GPS track, right? Super simple. But instead, they were using all their multiple sensors and everything. And the robot, at that point, it faced a problem where the GPS track that they had differed slightly from actually the real thing. Like the dirt road had changed a little bit or something like that. But it differed from what their sensors were seeing. And so they decided, the, robot, the way they'd set the, weight, the weighting of the various sensors is the robot decided to trust the GPS more than the sensors, and so it ignored the, what it was seeing on the road and tried to follow the GPS track and ran off the road. So the moral of the story there is it's a constant battle trying to decide what does the robot really know. The robot's getting all this information, and sometimes it disagrees what's really going on. And so having, a, having correct estimation of the state of the robot and the state of the world around the robot is key to making decisions that work. So successful exploits will most likely subvert that state estimation process by giving the robot apparent situations that it doesn't expect or information that's wrong. Um, just like with uh, the logic that humans use to use things, we can uh, think of the logic behind robot behavior in a hierarchical fashion. Um, so at the bottom, you've got your control loops, your stability maintenance. So for example, uh, with, a, with a drone, just being able to hover in place. Um, above that, you've got collision avoidance. So you can't do collision avoidance unless you've got control of the robot. Um, above that, you've got navigation and localization. But again, you don't want to navigate if you're going to run into things. So collision avoidance takes priority. Um, and then a, 
all the way up the top, you've got your task planners and your reasoners and just like dealing with the high level mission. Um, if, if you attack anything lower in this stack, you defeat everything above it, right? If you make the robot crash, it can't do navigation. Um, and that means that more engineering effort often is spent on guaranteed robustness at the lower levels. So the lower levels are juicier targets, but they're also more difficult targets. So here's some quick examples from the two projects from Prototype This that I mentioned uh, to begin with. Number one, we've got a fixed wing aircraft that delivers a payload in the form of a, uh, um, a life, life preserver in the ocean. Um, so at the uh, control loop level, we've got our autopilot PID loops. So basically being able to deal with gusts of wind and things like that, just making sure that the vehicle flies. Um, no collision avoidance at all. Because it's a fixed wing aircraft, you're up in the air, we just assume that we're in a space that there aren't any other things to crash into. But you know, if a bird flew in front of it or whatever, you'd totally crash into it. Um, navigation system is all GPS. So we've got waypoints. Uh, we've set a waypoint um, to make an, a, a sort of an approach path. We've set a, a, a waypoint for where the person is that needs the package. And then finally, our task planner generates this dynamic bombing run based on those GPS waypoints and says, OK, like, what's the optimum way that we can come in and make sure that we drop this thing in the right place? So we're vulnerable to collision. And our high-level logic depends on only one sensor on GPS. So just like in the previous talk, if we spoof GPS, we've owned the platform. Pizza delivery, uh, a little more complex system. So this is the local street level pizza delivery. So uh, in, on our uh, control loops and stability maintenance, it's a two wheel platform. So it's got a self balance. So we've got all these control loops running at the bottom level, just making sure that this thing doesn't fall over. Um, but of course, you can, if you kick it too hard, it will fall over. Uh, collision avoidance is done with dynamic obstacle uh, discrimination and avoidance. So it has basically um, a map that it's built up and it knows what's not supposed to be there and it avoids those dynamic things that are not supposed to be there. Um, and that map is also used for its navigation and localization. So we generate a sensor map and do SLAM on it, simultaneous localization and mapping. Um, and then at a very high level, we've got our motion task planner and our reasoners. So that basically says we're going to get from the base to where we're going. We're going to dispense the pizza only if the person displays the correct authentication credentials. And then we're going to return to base once we've delivered the pizza. Um, so this system, much more, much more sophisticated system than the aerial drone, um, not vulnerable to straightforward uh, collision things, for example. Um, but there are other attacks we can do to it. Redirection, trapping, map confusion attacks, right? Because that map is dynamically generated. So if we can create obstacles that don't seem dynamic, they're going to get incorporated into the map. And then the, the robot's going to have the, the wrong idea of the real world. So we'll get, more, get into that more la later. Um, quick thing on the logic structures underneath this. So basically, everything's going to have some level of state machine inside it. Um, and those states uh, might correspond to tasks that the robot has to do. Um, and transitions between them might be uh, task com completions, right? So successfully navigating to, for, to point B from point A, for example, or switches in the context, like, um, oh, well, I'm supposed to do something else now, uh, or even timeouts, like when the, when the robot Robots are not very good at sensing when they fail to complete a task. Right? Successful task completion is easy. Failure is not. And the robot will usually just keep trying. But sometimes you're like, all right, just forget it. Go do the next thing. Um, and then within individual states, you might have substate machines. Or you might have other reasoners and planners inside them. So there are vulnerabilities potentially in state estimation, um, in the transitions between them, so spoofing state transitions or preventing them from occurring. Um, or unexpected conditions within the states. So um, let's take a look at all the sensors that are used uh, on various autonomous vehicles. Uh, there's some are active and some are passive. So some uh, just re read in information from the environment, and some actually actively send out information and then get a return back on it. Um, and so examples of each, either of those. Obviously, GPS is passive because you're just receiving a signal. Um, Radar is active because you're sending out a signal and getting back a return. So here are some common sensors. And uh, I'm using one of Google's early cars here just to show you where they're located physically. So GPS, uh, very common. And usually, there'll be two GPS sensors. So you can do differential GPS, usually on the roof. So they've got a good unobstructed view of the sky. Uh, LIDAR, which is a basically like radar, but with light. Um, and 
the, the spinny things on the top of many vehicles are usually spinning LIDARs. Um, cameras are very common because cameras are cheap. Um, millimeter wave radar, uh, used for collision avoidance, uh, usually on the front and back of the vehicle. Uh, ultrasonic transducers uh, are present. Uh, I'll talk some more about that later. Um, then you have a digital compass so that you know which way north is. Uh, an IMU, inertial measurement unit, so that measures accelerations and gyroscopic forces so that you can get changes in, changes in angle. Uh, wheel encoders, so you can do odometry. Um, and then th these are all, you you'll find all these sensors on a car, on an autonomous car. But other applications will have different sensors. So underwater, for example, uh, a Doppler velocity logger uh, is an acoustic sensor that reflects uh, sonar pulses off the bottom, and so it allows you to determine your, your speed in, in the water column um, and how much distance you've traversed, uh, and things like scanning sonar un for underwater, um, and then for air and for underwater, you have pressure transducers so you can tell your altitude or your depth. Um, so that's, that's a quick overview, um, and a quick sort of list about things that are important about sensors. Uh, where the uncertainty comes from in your sensors are from noise. So that's where you're, the value that you're getting is not exactly what it should be in the real world. Uh, drift, so that's where your values change over time even if the thing in the real world is not changing. Um, and then latency and update rates. So if, you're, if it takes too long for your reading to be collected and processed and the real situation might have changed, um, or if you only get that reading like once a second or something like that, then the the real instantaneous state of things can be quite different from what, than, from what your sensors make it look like. Um, and so you need to model those uh, sources of uncertainty, and you have to make certain assumptions when you do that modeling. Um, and so that's a potential source of problems if your assumptions are not valid. Um, and then if you've got multiple sensors, you need to fuse them. And that's great because if you can fuse and data from multiple sensors together, you can, get, you can be more reliable because you can sort of sanity check one sensor with another and make sure they agree. Um, however, what do you do when they disagree? That's a big problem because, and that's an area of vulnerability because if you just always trust one more than the other, then that one's more, vul vul more vulnerable to an attacker. Um, or if you just don't know which one, one to trust, it can lead to kind of random behavior. Um, so the robustness of your robot may end up coming down to just how smart is that robot at discounting one sensor that an attacker has messed with? So let's look at some attacks here, um, which is manipulating the input to the robot. So there's two basic kinds of attack. You got your denial, your DOS attack on the sensor, so making sure that the sensor just cannot recover any useful data at all. Um, or you can spoof the sensor, Again, we, we saw that in the last talk. Getting the sensor to retrieve information that is incorrect specifically. So it's incorrect in, uh, in the way that the attacker wants it to be incorrect. Um, and then you've got a couple of attack modes if you're an attacker. You can just instantaneously attack the sensor. So every time the sensor reports data to the robot, it gets it wrong. Um, or you can do something a little more subtle and you can uh, um, you don't care about the robot making a bad decision right in that moment. Instead, you want to mess with the map, for example. You want to attack that aggregated data, lead the robot to make long-term bad decisions. Um, so let's start off with GPS. We know that that's a, a major reference for any vehicle that's in the air. So underwater vehicles don't use GPS, but planes, helicopters, cars, boats, they all use it. Um, denial is easy. You jam it. So you basically throw a bucket of RF noise at the sensor. You can buy a GPS jammer from sketchy Chinese websites uh, pretty cheaply. Uh, and you can even get the schematic on those websites if you want to build your own. But you're just basically building a noise transmitter. Um, it's super easy. Um, and then you can spoof it, uh, which is basically where you fake the signals at a higher power. Much more difficult because you've got to craft this signal. But it's also uh, there are tools available to make it not that hard. So here's an example um, that uh, I use, like to use as a great example from UT Austin's radio navigation lab of using GPS spoofing to take over a, a drone helicopter. And again, if you were sitting in the last talk, uh, you got to see a POC of that as well. Um, so basically, they are carefully putting their fake signal 
in the same place as what the vehicle expects, and then they're moving their higher powered local signal away from the vehicle. So for example, if they tell the vehicle it's going up, the vehicle is going to try and correct by going down, and you can crash it into the ground. So that's what this e example shows. They've got a, uh, a hovering drone helicopter here, and uh, there's a, a little thing will show up there showing who's in control and whether the GPS signal is real or fake. So you've got your remote pilot flying it, um, and suddenly they turn on the spoof GPS signal. The hacker's in control, and they're going to start telling the helicopter it's going to drift up. Instead, it goes down. And if the safety pilot didn't take over, it would have crashed right into the ground. That's the way that the Iranians claimed to capture this American um, RQ-7 military surveillance drone um, a few years ago. They said that they spoofed it to crash into the ground, and they put it on display, and uh, you know, made, took took a lot of uh, took a lot of press over it. Almost certainly not true, for two reasons. Because number one, the military uses a uh, encrypted GPS signal, so it's more difficult to spoof. And number two, because GPS is jammable and spoofable, military aircraft don't use it as a primary sensor. Um, they uh, it's, th it's there for information, but they're not going to do all of their navigation with it um, because they know that it's vulnerable to this. Um, in the civilian realm, GPS is used as a primary sensor often, and so I really like this footage. This is from the second DARPA Grand Challenge. So this is the winning vehicle, the one that ultimately won. It made it all the way from um, Los Angeles to Las Vegas, and you saw it there swerving off the road for no good reason, right? Because it's also got cameras. It's seeing the road perfectly, and I'll show a bit later uh, what that vehicle saw when it was driving uh, with its cameras, when I cover the camera section. No reason for it to do that swerving. So it's impossible to know without ha having access to the logs, but my guess is that it was trusting GPS too much, and there was some sort of GPS was trying to drag it off the path, and that's also a classic behavior, is that it'll sort of snap back. You know, as, as that sense of fusion happens, it's like trusting one, and then it's like, oh, something's really wrong here. I'm going to snap back to my other sensor. And so it's like drifting off and then snapping back. So I'm going to guess that's a GPS problem. Uh, this one also, I, I think this is a straight GPS problem. This is also from the, se from the second DAPA, DAPA Grand Challenge. Um, autonomous van here. And it's, it's not listening to any other sensors, right? It just drives straight over a Jersey barrier, um, which also is pretty cool, because like, I never knew you could drive right over those things if you wanted to, but apparently you can. Um, so that's th those are the drawbacks of relying too much on, on one sensor. Um, and then also latency and decision making. Right? If your GPS is only giving you a, a reading once a second, let's say, which is pretty typical for an um, aerial vehicle, on the ground, a lot of things can happen in a second. And you can be driving over a Jersey barrier and not even know it. Uh, illustrate again that we're not, we, when we're talking about GPS spoofing, we're not just talking about um, you know, aerial vehicles. Uh, there's some, some lab from UT Austin um, did it with a super yacht. So they, they found some rich dude uh, with a super yacht, and they were like, um, hey, can we like spoof your GPS and see if we could hijack your yacht? And the yacht owner was like, yeah, OK, that sounds interesting. I'd like to see that. Um, because when you're out at sea, you have no visual references for navigation. Right? Especially if it's during the day. At night, you could use a sextant you know, and take, take astronomical readings, but no one does. Right? We've, we've turned off most of the old things that sailors used to use to navigate. Even the Loran system was switched off a few years ago. GPS is what you got. So if you can spoof a GPS signal, uh, you know, maybe from an aerial vehicle that's out of, out of visual range, they can't see it, no one on that ship is going to notice that it's going off course. So here's their um, animation of what happened. They uh, send, their, send their fake GPS signal. And instead of changing, posi changing position here, they're um, sending signals to change the perceived GPS track of the vehicle. And they're going to make the vehicle think it's three degrees off from its, from its desired heading. And sure enough, the boat turned off its desired heading, and they were able to basically convince the ship where to go. And three degrees doesn't sound like a lot, but if you're traveling a thousand miles across an ocean, you can end up making that ship go a long way from where it was supposed to go. Uh, and there's the proof uh, from the ship's navigation system showing that it actually uh, went 
to the wrong place. And the hardware these guys used uh, to do this cost about $2,000. So versus a super yacht, which is, I don't know what, $100 million? Um, so there's now a lot of accessibility of these tools. Um, in uh, DEF CON 23, uh, a team from China uh, demonstrated a low-cost GPS simulator using a Blade RF. A Blade RF costs, I don't know, five or 600 euros. Um, and they showed that they were able to convince naviga in-car navigation systems to think they were in the middle of a lake instead of the car showroom, um, and things like that. And th now it's even easier. Uh, you can use a Hackr F1, like you saw in the last talk, uh, for 300 bucks, and you can use GPS SDR SIM, um, and it's totally possible. And there are mitigations for this, um, as the last speaker told about as well. Uh, and another one that, that he didn't mention um, that's super robust is if you develop a system with an antenna that wiggles, um, that high frequency wiggle of the antenna alters the carrier phase. So you can tell whether your signals are coming from multiple locations or a single location. Um, so that's a super robust GPS spoofing detection. However, go out and try and buy a GPS receiver that does that. You can't because security, as always, is not the highest priority for commercial, for commercial systems, uh, at least at present. So just to, just to show that I, I'm not full of shit here, um, I thought I'd, I thought I'd uh, have a little fun here. So we're going to switch over to the, um, to the camera. And So have we got, got video? So I've got my, got my stock Garmin GPS here. Um, and takes a little while to boot up because this, this is an old one. And there we go. Old map too. And let's see. This is this is this I first time I've done a live demo of this and Oh, I see. I am not transmitting. Right, hang on. The the demo gods are always always difficult. So this is this will be good because now we hopefully can see some signal come in. There we go. So we're in, we're indoors here. We shouldn't be getting any signals at all. Um, but as you can see, I can see a lot of satellites. And I think I have to have to think for a little while. Can you see that if I put that there? At the same time, I'll take this phone and I'll say that Google Maps can use my location while using the app. Maps. We'll see which one gets the idea here first. If you want to follow on in the audience uh, with a phone, you'll have to turn off uh, put your phone in airplane mode because um, the se sensor fusion, again, so the phone does Wi-Fi and cell tower geolocation as well. So um, it won't work if you have your phone being able to see cell towers and Wi-Fi networks. Uh, you need it to be in GPS only mode. Anyone, anyone else getting anything here? There's also probably a lot of 
wireless noise in this room because everyone, we, we've got like however many people in here, like 200 people with phones and blasting out plenty of RF. But as you can see, we're getting there anyway. Um, <laughs> All right, yes, so that's the point of my poll at the beginning, um, was to put everyone in Boston. Can you see where we are in Boston? Ah, here we go, the phone's got it. Um, so, as you can see, we're here on the East Coast. Oh, and we've got our accuracy on the, on here. Yeah, exactly. Uh, oops. So we're, we're at the name, we're at the location that is a famous hacker's handle in Boston, um, Weld Pond of the Loft. This, this seemed to happen so fast when I was testing it before this talk, but you know. Oh, it's it's dark in Boston, so we're in night mode. Uh, apparently, it thinks we're driving at 150 miles an hour, so um, I guess there's some jitter in the signal. I wish it would just show this map. Oh. Lame. Uh, here we go. So, well, all right. I didn't sacrifice the right goats uh, because the demo is like not as totally not as slick as I wanted it to be. But the real location that's being sent out uh, is not Blue Hills Reservoir. It's probably close to that. Um, it's Weld Pond. But uh, the guys in the front row got it. Um, I never. All right. Cool. You guys get the idea. So again, if you've got um, 300 euro burning a hole in your pocket, you too can uh, go and, and mess with mess with GPS signals, which obviously should only be done for educational purposes like we're doing here. Uh, moving on from GPS to LiDAR. Um, LiDAR is a laser rangefinder that scans, basically. So these things originally came from industrial monitoring sensors. They were used um, like the ones that are uh, here. That's like a ZIC laser rangefinder from a German industrial company, basically used to detect when people got into spaces they shouldn't be um, in factories and stuff like that, you know, to, to, for, for safety protection. But robot people were like, oh, this is actually an awesome sensor. We can see what's around the vehicle. Um, and so they started like sticking them all over their vehicles um, and uh, using it to scan the terrain around them. So they mechanically scan. There's like a mirror that rotates. Um, and they do collision avoidance, map building, and so on, because uh, you, what you end up with is a point cloud like this. So you get, get all of these 3D points uh, where you got a return, and it's up to you as the robot designer to make sense of that data and decide you know, what, how to stitch all these things together into solid objects and decide you know, what to do with it. Um, so in terms of vulnerabilities, you can uh, do denial by actively overpowering them. So if you just hit it with a blast of light in the right frequency, in the infrared usually, um, you can stop it from getting a useful return. Um, and then you can also spoof uh, in two ways. First of all, you can manipulate the target. So you can manipulate the absorbance or reflectivity of the thing that's being sensed. Um, or you can do active spoofing, um, where you send back information that is incorrect to the system. Um, so many of the sensors are essentially 2D, um, so they're highly dependent on the orientation. So here's the pizza delivery robot, um, and you can see on the left, that's what the LiDAR is seeing. It's only just seeing this like line scan, 
And so every time that thing leans forward, um, its returns move you know, closer, and, uh, closer to the robot, and when it leans back, they move further away just from the ground in front of it. Um, and so when you've got a steep incline, it can look like an obstacle, right? Because if, if, it's, if, the, if that line is coming back with something in front of you, um, it can look like an obstacle. And then also, if something's below the line, and so the line scanner never even sees it, like a curb or something like that, it can miss it. Um, and in general, because it's an active emission sensor, it can only see what returns a signal back to it. So if, you, if it gets nothing back, it assumes there's nothing there. Or it's like, you just have to assume there's nothing there um, as, a as the robot designer. So what that means is anything that's over the horizon, um, anything that's out of range returns nothing at all. So most of the world returns no data to this sensor. Most of the world just is just a, a, a blank expanse of nothingness. It also means that things that are absorbent uh, look like nothing, and so that uh, you know, if you uh, paint a, a light-absorbing thing on the side of a wall, it could look like a tunnel, the classic Wiley Wiley Coyote trap, um, and then also transparent objects. Uh, the light will go right through it. Um, some of the newer Velodyne lidars do multiple return, so they'll uh, give you one one return that's like. A strong, whatever the strong return is, and then they'll give you a secondary weak return, and so they're a little bit better at detecting semi-transparent objects, but they're still not great. Um, another thing that's a, an interesting failure mode of the LiDAR is that reflective things can confuse it a lot, um, because it can bring, like, so, so for example, a puddle on the road, um, it can bring far away things close, right, because if that active output bounces off the puddle, hits a tree, now it looks like you've got a small tree on the road in front of you, right? Uh, it also means that if you've got something which doesn't return, it looks like a ditch, um, right? So you're bouncing your signal off the puddle, it's going up into the air, there's nothing there, you get nothing back, and so, oh, that looks like a hole in the road. So you've got some, you got some problems uh, there, and if you can make that look like a big hole, then the vehicle has to avoid it, so you've just tricked the vehicle into having to go somewhere else. Um, but they have to be really big. But because, because of this problem, the vehicles are usually programmed to just ignore small holes, right? Just be like, all right, I can drive over a small hole because the LiDAR sees small holes everywhere. Um, here's an interesting thing uh, from an adversarial perspective. This is a document that was captured uh, from Al-Qaeda in the, uh, in the uh, African Peninsula, um, like in an Al-Qaeda offshoot in, in Mali. Um, and they've got a couple of references here to um, like uh, attempts to defeat military systems. So that's a reference to a uh, GPS jammer from Russia called a Rakal. Um, and then this line is a reference to uh, using reflective materials on vehicles to try and reflect laser designators off the vehicles um, to, to try and make them make themselves a little more resistant to missile attack. Um, Again, you have to be careful about this because you have to make sure that you know the wavelength of the laser that's being used, uh, but it's a technique. Um, reflectance is also a feature, though, that the robot, that the unmanned vehicle designers use to uh, get more information about the world. Uh, and one of those is in road line detections. So um, you can obviously use a camera to detect the lane markings and so on on a road, uh, but that can be really hard when you're driving at night in the rain, for example, and, ev and everything's reflective. It can be really hard to see, see the lane markings, uh, but the LiDAR can do a good job of seeing it um, by looking at the, the bits that don't reflect, uh, sorry, the bits that don't give a return because the, the road lines are more reflective than the road itself. And if you can stitch those together into shapes that make sense, you can be like, oh, okay, that's a lane marking or that's an instruction on the road. Um, so, for example, seeing like pedestrian crossing signs on the road and stuff like that, the LiDAR is a really good sensor for that. Uh, but it also means that we can fake road markings in a way that a human wouldn't notice, right? Because we can paint it in black on black on the road, and it's likely that a human wouldn't see it, but the robot sees it great. So, you know, we can put fake uh, swervy line markings on the road, make the robot do weird things, um, or even just like leave messages for the people back at Google or whatever to see um, and uh, make, make them angry. I don't know. Um, and then one final super basic attack on LiDAR is that you don't get that transmittance information. So just like with the, uh, with the transparent obstacles, um, you can put things that look solid, right, so that the car 
thinks I have to avoid that um, because that looks like a giant boulder, uh, but really it's just like you know a big wad of crumpled up paper or something like that. Um, so that's uh, all of these sort of passive um, uh, ways to ways to spoof. Uh, you can also do active active jamming and spoofing. Um, so as long as you know where the lidar is, right, you can point a point a source at it and you can prevent it from seeing the return it's supposed to see. Um, so um, this is using a strong source to overpower the lidar. So th that's the actual return from a multi-line Velodyne. Uh, LiDAR system, so you're, it's scanning at, at multiple levels to give you, give you that 3D information. Um, you point a strong laser at it, and you have managed to blind it in that one spot. So it sees, it's seeing the rest of the world, but that one spot that's maybe an obstacle you want it to run into, um, it, has, it doesn't see it anymore. Uh, but a, a bit more interesting result from that same research from KAIST um, is that if your source is within a sort of narrow band of um, output power, you can cause false positives. Um, and that takes advantage of a quirk of the design of most of these high-end high LIDARs. Because they're 360 degree scanning, they need a cover on the outside that's optically transparent. And so they use a curved glass on the outside, right? Because you don't want seams and stuff blocking the view. Um, those curved glasses refract at a different amount depending on the strength of, your atta of an attacking light source. So if you're attacking light source, um, is off angle, you can actually convince it to see dots that are not, to see returns that are not between you, the attacker, and the LiDAR. So here's an example. For example, if you've got a, a vehicle that's driving along next to um, a, a, a driverless vehicle that you're trying to confuse, um, you can point your LiDAR from next to it and make it see things in front of it, even though that's not where you are. Um, and so here's the difference uh, in, that the output power makes. So a weak. Um, a weak light source uh, shows that uh, there are some dots in between the attacker and the system. Um, and then here for a strong, you can see the induced fake returns are off to the side. So uh, we, can f we can force a vehicle to stop even if we're not right next to it. Um, here's a more sophisticated spoofing attack. It's a relay attack. So what we can do is we can look for the pulses from the real LiDAR. And that will give us some information that we need, uh, which is the pulse rate um, and the time difference uh, that the system is expecting. And then we can use that. We can characterize the source. And then we can send back our return pulses in advance of getting the, the pulses from the system. So we can simulate a target in between us that's closer to the, to the, uh, to the vulnerable vehicle than we are. So, um, obviously, the timing is really critical here. You need a little time to characterize the source before you can do it. But once you have it, you can see here that um, sending pulses back that are slightly afterwards give us indu induced returns that are um, further away uh, from you know, not between us and the target. Um, and here, uh, by changing that timing, we can make those false returns, that false obstacle look like it's between us and the system. Um, so this is, a, this is a very difficult attack to practically pull off, obviously, because you, ne you need to know exactly where the LiDAR is. You need to be able to observe it for long enough that you get its timing and beam characteristics. Uh, probably easier to do from a fixed platform. But once you have, then you can generate these fake obstacles. Um, and so these systems that rely on LiDAR to the exclusion of everything else, like especially, let's say, You've got a driverless vehicle. Sure, you've got GPS, but you can't use GPS when you're in a parking garage. So when you're in the garage, you're probably going to use LiDAR for almost everything. And that's a point where the vehicle is very vulnerable because you can trick the LiDAR. Um, one system that's out there a lot is the Tesla, Tesla Autopilot system. Uh, and that's an interesting system because it doesn't use LiDAR at all. So Tesla is doing everything uh, primarily with vision. So they've got cameras um, everywhere pointing in all directions from the, from the vehicle. Uh, they're also using white radar, which I'll cover soon. Um, and uh, they're using uh, ultrasonic sensors. So quick stuff on cameras. Um, cameras are used for specialized object detection. So in the case of Tesla Autopilot, they're looking for pedestrians on the road, and they're looking for other vehicles. Um, and sometimes systems use stereo uh, 
although not so commonly, uh, not Tesla, for example, uh, but not so commonly in deployed systems, but they are used. Uh, one thing they're often used for is to colorize the LiDAR. So what that means is to take your LiDAR data and then add color information to it, fuse it with the, uh, fuse it with the camera. So here's what I promised to show you earlier from the um, uh, Stanley vehicle in the second DARPA Grand Challenge. This is how it's doing its road versus non-road detection. It's getting that LiDAR map, and then it's fusing it with color inf information from the camera, and then it's deciding, like, okay, if it looks flat, and it's the right color, we can extend that beyond the range of the LiDAR and get an idea of the road ahead, and so we can drive really fast. That's how basically it won the second DARPA Grand Challenge. But that's how we also know that when we saw it driving off the road, it was probably having a GPS problem. So cameras are easily denied by blinding them with dazzling lights, um, and they're also uh, sp easily spoofed by the same camouflage techniques that work on people. Um, and if they make assumptions about color, we can subvert those. If they think green things are grass they can drive on, we can make green obstacles. Um, and we can use repeating patterns to confuse stereo systems because stereo systems depend on being able to match parts of the image from both cameras. Um, as machine learning vision has become better and more popularly deployed, it's still not actually used that, lot in that much in driverless vehicles, uh, but it's getting there. So people have do started doing a lot of adversarial spoofing and trickery for machine learning vision systems. So uh, this is a famous paper um, that where they were able to put just black and white tape on stop signs that would uh, fool a system that was designed to detect stop signs into thinking the stop sign was something else. Um, and as you can see, a human can still see that as a stop sign, but the system thought it was something totally different. So that's one side of adversarial uh, 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 examples, which is to impede detection of real things in the environment. The other is to cause uh, false detection of fake things that are not in the environment. Um, so uh, here's another example um, of impeding detection of real things. So this had a neural network model to detect people, and then by adding noise to the image, um, they were able to make an adversarial example where the people were not recognized anymore. Um, now, these systems, like this is super preliminary stuff because most of these are like white box techniques. So these, these research papers are usually done by researchers who've designed the neural network in the first place. They kind of know how it works and how they can make it fail. Um, that second example, for example, if you can inject noise, like crafted noise into the camera am image, it probably means you have a presence on the internal network of the vehicle, and if that's the case, there's like way better ways you can mess the vehicle up. So it's just not, not that useful of an example. Um, and in the case of the, the stop signs, same thing. They knew how their stop sign detector worked. Um, if they were trying a, a black box attack, it would be much more difficult to craft something. And they also are not that reliable in the, in the face of parametric distortions, right? They, they feel like you know, they, they can view the stop sign from very constrained angles, but in the real world, they don't know exactly how the car is going to see it. There's going to be lots of changes in lighting conditions and stuff like that. So this, these techniques are not that applicable yet. But one really great one that's, uh, that, that's fun to mention um, is the adversarial turtles. So they, these guys generated a um, perturbed model that they were able to 3D print on a 3D printer that also printed textures. And so they trained a system to recognize various objects, and then they were able to print this turtle Looks like a turtle to us, but it's been adversarially crafted so that the system thinks it's a rifle instead. Um, so, you know, once uh, th and they were able to print this model and they could show it to the camera from all kinds of angles, and it would the system would still think it was a rifle even from various angles. So, if you have uh, access to the system, you can do some fun stuff. But again, because it's white box, uh, real world applicability to a system that you don't know how it was designed is probably low. Um, from cameras, radar um, being used in vehicle applications. So radar is what the a millimeter wave radar is what the scanners at the airport use to, to look at your junk. Um, and in the cars, case of cars, they uh, are used for collision avoidance primarily. Um, and so they give you a low resolution image, much lower than the lidar. Um, and most things in the world are very reflective to the, to the Radar. So the radar is kind of like last ditch collision avoidance uh, instead of being a primary navigation sensor. Um, there's some interesting denial and spoofing. You can jam it. Um, you can use chaff the same way that uh, aircraft use to defend themselves against radar guided missiles. 
Um, and then an interesting thing is signs over over the road are very reflective to the laser, and they're so ref to the radar, and they're so reflective that anything underneath the sign probably won't be seen. So um, a, a, a driverless vehicle basically ignores their radar collision sensors if in, in areas where there are signs. Um, so here's an example: the Bosch LR3, which is used by Tesla for their autopilot, um, and in, at DEF CON 24, a Chinese group uh, demonstrated it being jammed with about $100,000 worth of uh, RF generation equipment. Um, but you can see there that the autopilot um, does not, the Tesla autopilot does not see a car in front of it when the jamming is running. Um, and they also theorized spoofing and relay attacks but did not perform them. Um, Moving on from there, I mentioned earlier inertial measurement units and the compass. Uh, so these are what military aircraft use because they're essentially unspoofable. Um, although if you can get close enough to give them magnetic noise, you can interfere with a magnetic compass. Um, you can make them very accurate. So for example, the uh, IMU from a Boeing 777 has about 0.1% of the distance traveled as its error. So that means when you're underwater vehicle or your uh, plane or whatever, goes 300 kilometers, by the time you get to the destination, your estimate is within 300 meters of where you think, or where you're supposed to be. So pretty accurate. Um, and they're very difficult to interfere with, which is why they tend to be the primary sensor for military, uh, military systems, military air systems, and, and uh, water-based systems anyway. Um, but you can do physical attacks with magnetic fields, with temperature, thermal drift. And then one really interesting one that just came out, you can do acoustic attacks on MEMS uh, gyroscopes. So MEMS stands for Micro uh, Electromechanical Systems, and so a MEMS gyroscope is a little chip, but inside the chip there's, a, uh, there's an element that's being electrified and it's causing it to vibrate at a resonant frequency. And the and it, mo forces that are being measured as, that, um, as you move that chip in space um, from, from the gyroscopic forces lets you know what the, what the system is doing. And it turns out you can affect the vibration of that element by blasting a noise at it that's close to the resonant frequency. So you excite it with a strong acoustic source. Just like those attacks that people have been, been in the news lately, screaming in the data center type attacks, right, where you blast noise at a hard disk and you vibrate their read heads and you can't, can't read the data anymore and you can even damage the hard disk. Same principle. Um, so you can, uh, this has been successfully POC'd, uh, also by a team at KAIST. So blasting acoustic noise at a flying drone, and you can see here, these are the outputs from the rotor control systems on the four rotors of a quadcopter drone. And you see when the sound is turned on, in the middle up there, the control system goes completely crazy because it's getting totally junk information from, um, from the gyros. Again, that's an attack you have to be pretty close to use, and you have to have a big speaker that you can generate a lot of noise. But it's certainly if you have a point installation that you want to defend against drones um, that use low-cost gyros, you can use this defense. Um, and then I think this is the final sensor one that I have, wheel odometry. So you have encoders on the wheels. They're actually super useful because uh, they give you your true speed and they can tell you when the vehicle has stopped. Um, so to attack that, you can attach stuff to the wheels that change its diameter, um, or you can use slippery surfaces. Um, and you can rub it off. So here's an example from prototype this where we autonomously crossed the highway bridge and the car gets all the way across the bridge, but once it got there, it took the turn too close and scraped the wall and it scraped off its uh, wheel encoder. And you can see it hanging there. And suddenly the car thought it was driving, but it got nothing back from the odometer and it was like, I don't know what's going on. You know, I, I feel like I'm moving, but my wheel sensor tells me I'm not moving. I'm just gonna stop. So that's a, that's a super super basic attack that definitely works. Um, oh yeah, I added ultrasonic sensors, which I um, there's been some recent work in. I, I, at first, I just didn't care about ultrasonic sensors because uh, they're mo only really used for automated parking, and it's like if the vehicle's parking itself and you just want to mess up its parking job, you know, who really cares? But I'm putting in here for completeness, um, so you can do all the same kind of attacks uh, plus one. Um, so you can jam them. So you send out ultrasonic chirps uh, that just confuse it. So here's um, some stuff that was presented at DEF CON 24 um, of jamming both, both a Tesla and an Audi uh, ultrasonic sensor. Um, and you can see there it, it failing to see an obstacle that's really present in the real world. Um, you can also spoof it. So you send out chirps from your system that 
actually don't relate to a real thing, and so you can make it see obstacles that aren't there. You can see again the Tesla uh, and the Audi both spoofed. Um, and then you can do cancellation attacks where you, it's li kind of like the LiDAR attack, it's a much more sophisticated attack where you're listening for the chirps and you're sending uh, an interfering chirp at the same, at the same timing. Um, I, I totally understand that uh, I'm because probably because of the demo, I'm running over time here, so I'm gonna like basically let Matthias drag me off the stage when he wants to not get behind schedule. I can see him lurking there. Um, so uh, I, I know that I, I, th I think I've got like four minutes to be like on the original schedule. So just, but yeah, just like say the word when you want me to finish this. Um, but uh, the map is super important for unmanned systems um, as they seem to be developing, right? So the Google car and stuff like that, Google's all about mapping, so the map has a huge emphasis on it, um, and it's often considered basically to be the truth, right? If it's in the map, it's real. If it's not in the map, then it's an obstacle or it's something that, like a, a dynamic thing that we have to avoid. Um, and so that makes your vehicle not have to be as smart, um, and it makes it easier to do things like detect traffic lights and vegetation um, that otherwise, just like looking for every plant in the world or looking for everything that might be a traffic light, that's really hard. But if you know where the traffic lights are, um, then you can know where to look for them. So uh, here's the traffic light slide. Um, and the vulnerability here is that these are shared roads that we're using, right? So if there's a traffic light, even where the robot doesn't expect it, um, a human's gonna see that traffic light and they're gonna stop, right? Or if they see a green light, the human's gonna go. Um, and they're gonna expect the robot to do the same thing. But if the robot doesn't know the traffic light is there because someone's put a fake traffic light somewhere, the robot's just gonna blow right past it. So you can do an exploit there that takes advantage of the fact that, that the, the human's gonna expect one thing and maybe go through this intersection and the robot's just gonna um, breathe, you know, expect the other traffic to stop and the robot's just gonna breeze through it because it's not even looking for the light there. Um, and then vegetation can be an issue too. Colorized LiDAR helps, um, but Real, real example, one of the times that I rode in the Google car, it went totally crazy when we were driving down this otherwise completely s unoccupied straight s section of road because the trees had grown since the map was made and the leaves were overhanging into the road. They're not on the map, so they must be an obstacle. And so the robot was like, no way, man. Like, there's like stuff here. I'm not going through that. But it was just the trees had grown, you know. So you got to keep the map really up to date. Um, and it really sort of shows that discrimination rules are still kind of brittle. Um, this uh, also talks about vulnerabilities of the map. So uh, if the map is stored on the robot, then you can put unexpected things in the world that the robot doesn't expect to see, uh, and the robot won't know about it. And then if the map is coming down from Google servers or wherever, then you can, then that's vulnerable too. So you can jam it, um, or you can spoof it. You can MITM their connection. Um, you know, once, you've, once, the, once the vehicle has an internet connection, as we all know, there's all kinds of things we can do to it. Um, I like this, this animation, by the way. This is like sort of not related, but I like it so much I put it in here. This is a, a, a set of fully simulated, fully autonomous vehicles that don't have to stop at intersections. So you can see they just adjust their speed based on the detection of the other vehicles, and so they just whoosh, through the intersection. Totally terrifying if you're in the car. Like you would, you would have to just have black windows to have passengers in those vehicles. Um, so I don't know, in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip ahead uh, because I think it's obvious about uh, sort of some of these attacks, um, like trapping the robot by making it think that there's walls around it that it can't escape from, um, or making it go a different way that you want it to by putting fake obstacles. Um, you could use swarms of obstacle robots, for example, robots versus robots, um, fake stop signs, all that kind of stuff. So do things that a human wouldn't notice, but the robot, because it has, has been programmed with a high level of safety, uh, it, it's not able to ignore them. Um, and then you can um, do clobbering attacks where you basically make the robot run into something. Okay, so you, you trick the robot into thinking there's not an obstacle when there really is, and you make it crash. So an obvious thing that you might wanna do um, with subtle deviations from the map, light vegetation, uh, simulating something that's cu coming in rapidly, so the robot has to also ra react rapidly and maybe crash itself into something else, um, and do obstacles that maybe are closer to the robot than it thinks it is, so you can scrape sensors off and things like that. So, quick reminder of everything I showed you today. Uh, do not use it for e evil. Uh, don't hassle the Hoff uh, 9000. 
uh, don't hacks all the bots. Um, and then let's also remember that the information here um, is going to we can use it to get things right because we've still got time. You know, we've got all these testing of driverless vehicles, um, but they're not they're not here yet. They're being, you know they're still very much in evaluation mode. Uh, this is a, a funny quote from Tech Review in 2014 talking about how you know it can't park, can't drive in snow or heavy rain, which drive straight over a pothole. A lot of these things have been fixed since 2014, but there's still plenty of uh, plenty of reason to believe that. It's not going to be happening tomorrow. Um, but one thing that is getting rolled out that I just wanted to quickly quickly show uh, in, in my last minus one minutes uh, is the vehicle to vehicle communications, um, which should be of interest to many people here, um, which are a, a, a series, of, it's a specification for a system that uh, sends warnings um, to the driver in cases of rear end collision avoidance, uh, forward collision, when the vehicle in front of you is braking, that kind of stuff. So just warnings, no control uh, for now. Um, but it uses a uh, dedica dedicated short-range communication system, so basically little radio transmissions with uh, 200 to 500 byte packets um, that are both on vehicles and on infrastructure, so V2V and V2I, um, and this basic safety message protocol. That is, yes, not encrypted because you want everyone to read it, um, but it is authenticated with PKI, so it's got all of, the, all of the problems that we know and love from the web coming to your vehicle soon. Um, via certificates. Um, so here's the sort of like specification of the packets. You've got a core, um, and then you've got a second part that's appended only when it changes, very specific to various vehicles. Uh, just one thing to draw your attention to, unencrypted GPS. So that's great if we're spoofing GPS, because we can see if it worked or not. We can uh, get information back from the remote vehicle that tells us whether it's locked onto our signal or not. Um, most of the security uh, is privacy related because obviously if you've got your car broadcasting all kinds of information about what it's doing, um, very clear privacy implications. Um, the initial deployment is super limited. So if you look down here at the, at the diagram, the dashed line is the initial deployment. So like most of this diagram is not in the initial deployment, but eventually they expect to deliver a lot of stuff. Um, certificates are pre-installed in, in vast quantities because each certificate's only valid for five minutes each. Um, and they still have to decide about renewal, updates, revocations, all the stuff that, where, where the, all those edge cases that we like to exploit. Um, and a lot of this, uh, like, you know, splitting functions for privacy protection. So a lot of privacy um, functionality, like lo location obscures, uh, stuff like that. So, you know, certificates will be very, very easy to get valid certificates because every car is going to have thousands of them pre-installed because they're only valid for five minutes. But how fast can you revoke a certificate? Five minutes is a long time on the road. Uh, bottom line is slow rollout. 11 years uh, of development to produce that document that I showed the front page of, and they're expecting it to take 37 years for deployment to the full fleet of vehicles on the road. So, you know, while we're talking about like, hey, robots are coming tomorrow, it's going to take 37 years just for cars to talk to each other, all right? Um, and they care a lot more about tracking and privacy than other kinds of malicious attacks. Um, and it's not even talking about direct control. So actually, in terms of like automated control of vehicles on the public roads, we might have robots first. Um, and go check out uh, Cesar Cerruto's talk at DEF CON 22 if you want to see everything that's wrong with current traffic sensor systems that they tried to fix with V2V. Um, the fact that there's like basically no authentication um, and you can ha push unencrypted, unsigned firmware updates to these things that are buried in the road, right? So like they're never going to be dug up uh, and fixed. So we're, they're hoping to avoid those mistakes, but of course they'll probably make other ones too. Uh, so that's it. I'm sorry I had to skip through the end stuff so quickly, <laughs> um, but uh, I just wanted to throw one kind of, uh, I love propaganda posters, so I like to manipulate them. So that's the dream. Again, don't do anything bad to the, to the driverless vehicles, but let's understand their secu security vulnerabilities to make sure that we don't have a total disaster on our hands out there in the world. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much.